Coming up on TechZilla, Verizon's iPhone, Alex is back. We're gonna edit and share 3D video archiving on thumb drives. Is this really a good idea? Color printer picks, swapping three terabyte drives, cheap HD camcorders, and Veronica's geeky new hobby. So check out Serafina's ring, she's engaged. And get back on the couch, because TechZilla starts now. This episode of TechZilla is made possible by HostGator. Green energy web hosting, get 20% off your order with the Revision 3 discount. Netflix, netflix.com slash TechZilla to get a free trial membership. Carbonite Online Backup. Start your free trial at carbonite.com with the offer code TechZilla and get two bonus months if you decide to buy. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Welcome to TechZilla. Hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or want to know where the best Buffalo Burger in San Francisco is, mm. we've got an answer for you. Yeah, my house. Really? Yes. Do you make Buffalo Burgers? For years. Mm. We also know where the saddest teenager in the San Francisco area is as well. <laughs> in the control room, She's waiting control to get her room. iPhone back. Waiting to get her precious little iPhone back. <laughs> <laughs> We want to thank Rhiannon, and Grace's daughter, bringing in her iPhone, Verizon 4, Verizon iPhone 4 in for us to show off for everybody. Bam. Yeah, it's, I mean, it looks like an iPhone. Don't drop it, by the way. The, the main difference between this and other iPhones you may have seen in the past is that, oh, five bars of service. Actually, let, let's, oh. yeah, let, me, let me clean up the front <laughs> of mine now. so we can make sure everybody sees this. Right, it, it's the iPhone on Verizon, slightly different antenna design, so there's no grip of death. and. Oh, will you look at that. Two bars on AT&T, five bars on Verizon. You could say that, oh, Verizon's lying about the reporting, except that I know three people who have already picked up the Verizon iPhone and commented on, oh, look at that. I know they had huge pre-order numbers, too. Yeah, huge pre-order huge. numbers. Um, and, and people have been taking around to all the dead spots in San Francisco. Just and a apparently, test. Just a test, and apparently nice. Verizon works. All right, well, let's talk about some of the major differences. Uh, first of all, of course, this is a CDMA phone, not GSM. You can't use data while talking. Um, it does have tethering, which is nice. Uh, someday AT&T will catch up, of course. They say. <laughs> yeah. On the Verizon iPhone, um, if you're tethering on 3G, you'll get a heads up that there's an incoming call. It's like the old days right. with the iPhone. I mean, if, if you had an iPhone from the get-go, it did the same thing, basically. Um, Daring Fireball points out Verizon has more consistent connections and better voice quality. And other than that, it's, it's an iPhone. Yeah. It's it's, you've seen it before. No grip of death. It's not not major news. And, and, and it's, it's interesting. Cool. Yeah. A lot, not just during Viral, but other people have pointed out that the, the voice quality does seem to be better on Verizon compared mm -hmm. to AT and T. Well, if by voice quality you mean you can actually hear someone's voice and make a phone call with it, then yes. Oh, I'm joking. <laughs> yes, I know also the the qualitative factors of it as well. I um, have finally gotten the microcell to start working again in my house. Cool. The problem, I don't know what the problem was, but once I deleted my phone number off of the AT and T website uh -huh. with the micro cell um, and then put it back on suddenly it kicked in again <laughs> so I can make phone calls in my house which is nice but I was using the Skype situation for a while and that was kind of nice too so basically all you need is a $150 piece of hardware which apparently AT&T yeah. has started giving away the last month and uh, anticipating the arrival of mm -hmm. Verizon's iPhone yeah they're changing a lot over there trying to get people to stay on AT&T well step it up AT&T and you'll keep our business indeed <laughs> In breaking news, our very own Veronica Belmont has discovered the outside. I hesitate to say she's <laughs> actually developing some kind of hiking, camping affection for the great outdoors, but rumor has it her World of Warcraft guild is sending out pictures of her on wee virtual World of Warcraft milk cartons. <laughs> Veronica, while you're wandering meet space with a GPS in hand, you've discovered Geocaching. Geo I have discovered geocaching. I am very excited. Um, I knew about it forever, right. of course. The sport because... of Will Wheaton and other internet gods. Yes, it's super fun. Um, I went geocaching this weekend. I had my first experience. I found three geocaches on Saturday alone. Um, I had so many great recommendations and noob tips from my Twitter followers that I decided to also extend <laughs> this question to you guys out there because I have a feeling there's a lot of overlap between Texilla viewers and geocachers. I don't know why. I just have a feeling. Some of you seem to enjoy going outdoors. <laughs> yeah, I want to uh, know what kind of GPS unit I should really have. I've been wandering around with my iPhone right now using the geocaching app from the right. geocaching website, and um, it works okay. There's a little bit of like, there's like a 32-foot accuracy issue, so you can be close to it, but not really right. be on top of it. I feel like a regular 
like hand GPS unit might be a little more exact. Um, geocaching, for those of you who don't know, it's like a treasure hunt using GPS devices. People hide caches, which are usually in like Tupperware containers or something like an ammo right. box, and they put little trinkets, trinkets inside that you can either not take, you can you can trade up and put something of slightly higher value in the box. You don't just take the stuff though. It's not like a treasure hunt. You don't get the pirate's booty and get to keep everything right. you find. Don't be geocaching scum. Right. The, the, <laughs> the game is more, it's all about the hunt, you know, finding it and having fun. Sometimes you can find little travel bugs that can be tracked from geocache to geocache. Cool. Um, there's a huge community of you guys out there and there's all sorts of fun community events as well. Um, Roger, Serafina and I actually went geocaching during our lunch break today <laughs> and we, we got right on top of where the cache was and we couldn't find it and so I marked that I couldn't find it on the website and right. the guy who left the cache said that he had just removed it for maintenance like earlier that day. <laughs> And so he hadn't Hours. even marked it on the website, so it was still marked as live. And so that's why we didn't find it. But we were very close. Uh, and for more info on geocaching, you can head over to geocaching.com. But yeah, I want to know what you guys are using. Like I said, there's iPhone and Android apps out there, but I want a serious, hardcore, rugged, long-lasting GPS device. Um, I'm sure you could probably loan me one or six devices that you probably have I, at home. I have tapered down the number of GPS devices from way too many to one or three. What was that company I was looking at? Well, Delorme. You're, you're, yeah. Delorme does the really beautiful full color maps. Yeah. Uh, Garmin obviously is a top choice. A lot of people like Magellan. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll get lots more from you guys. By the totally. way, if you have any really good geocaching uh, runs in uh, southern Utah, especially anything around Zion and the Escalante Staircase, let me know because I'll be traveling all around there uh, in April. We should start on a geocaching team. <laughs> He's like, oh, I don't really want to spend weekend time with you. <laughs> yeah, as long as you don't, I, I would, you know it's what? Like, yeah. If you don't, no, no, no. no. If, if you're ready to have the full on toddler hiking experience. Ooh, toddler hiking experience. Can I bring my cats on a leash? Absolutely. They'll be They'd slightly more that. manageable. Hmm. <laughs> Actually, the nice thing is we can put the cats in a box. That's People true. get upset when you do that with small children. If you've been having trouble getting your regular fix of TechZilla via an RSS subscription, my apologies. They should be working now. Revision 3 did a major adjustment on our rendering process. We basically eliminated the least watch feeds, XVID, WMV for phones, which I think three people were watching, and the 24 frames per second 720p HD feed. Uh, basically, we have now cut the time it takes us to render the 20-odd shows Revision 3 produces every week by half. That's a big deal because we're automating the process finally, moving it to an a outside source, and reducing the amount of time it takes means we will be able to get the show to you regularly. We also found out some really arcane stuff about RSS feeds, or did after you all mailed in about missing <laughs> shows. We have fixed that, which required Ryan, one of our beloved developers, to go in and manually tweak every RSS feed for every show. I feel his pain. Um, as for the first generation original Apple TV adopters, you obviously know the 30 frames per second 720p HD version of the show, or all of our shows, uh, works on just about everything out there except the first generation Apple TV. Uh, my apologies, but we are not going to bring that back because it takes a lot of time to render and there are really very few people looking at it because pretty much everybody except for Apple TV, first gen Apple TV users can use the 30 frame per second HD version mm. of the show. Gotcha. So my apologies. Uh, there's a blog entry, you can learn more about this. Change to Revision 3 show formats, attention XFID, WMV, and Apple TV users. we got a link to that in the show notes. Yeah. From the uh, what? No <laughs> cup holders department, HP whipped out the new TouchSmart 610 all-in-one PCs this week. 23 inches, 1920 by 1080 touchscreen flat panel PCs. Uh, they also happen to recline up to 60 degrees so you can touch your windows in more comfort. It's pretty, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like, time. you know, you can use it at your desk and you can stand up and use, you, it's just. I kind of, yeah, I kind of like that that 60 degree angle point. That's that's kind of nice. Um, HP will offer them in both Intel and AMD powered versions. Packed with blue Blu-ray and webcam starting at around $900. There's going to be a vis business version, the 9300 Elite Business PC that will launch in May. Mosey replacements, we're still uploading, so we'll talk about that next week. Yes. In the meantime, let's look at Matt's email. Do you read this one? Sure. He writes in, I am wondering about using flash drives for long-term storage that will only be accessed once a year and stored in a fire safe. Last year, my notebook fell victim to the dreaded clicking hard drive, and I lost all my tax return files. I backed up most of them, but the 2009 files are lost to the ether. As I never want to experience this frustration again, I want to back up my tax data to a dedicated device, something that's secure, reliable, and local. I have checked into Mosey and Carbonite, but I can't see spending that much to save a couple 
couple of 20 kilobyte files. Um, currently, USB flash drives are really inexpensive, but I've never been too sure about the long-term storage potential of these. What would you recommend, Matt? Yeah, it really depends on how you define long-term. And before we talk about that, I want to also point out that you know, fire safes may or may not be as fireproof as you think they are. And if they are not secured or locked down in some way, uh, if someone breaks into your house, they will often just carry the whole damn safe out with well, yeah. them. Yeah. It's also amazing to realize how many inexpensive home safes you can break into with, you know, a, a basically like a jimmy. <laughs> it just doesn't take a lot. So, awesome. yeah, it's a warning. This is, and we talk about this all the time, backing up locally, awesome, backing up locally and remotely, You've actually got a backup plan there. Doubly awesome. Yeah. I, I emailed our drive recovery guru, Scott Moulton, over at myharddrivedie.com about the flash drive longevity thing. And his answer, point blank, all he said was, to be honest, I think for the small amount of data he's talking about, it would be generally less than two gigs. That would be covered for free by the two gig limit on Mosey. Dropbox has two gigs free as well. Carbonite's an option. Microsoft SkyDrive gets you uh, 25 gigabytes for free. He says, I would recommend doing both local backup and have a script or program to do an online backup of the data to a free or inexpensive site. And then I'm like, come on, dude, what about longevity on flash drives? How long do they last? He goes, it does not have a shelf life worth discussing. This man takes his storage seriously. It will actually only have a retention time of about five wow. years, according to the engineering diagrams from Micron. Very interesting to know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically like flash memory cells, they have a finite life cycle, the number of times it can be reprogrammed, erased, programmed, and written to. Mm -hmm. Most folks never actually hit those, but if you basically, you know, because I was talking to some people at SanDisk about this too, they're like, look, the biggest problem they run into at SanDisk is people losing the drive. Hmm. Right, because mm -hmm. they're so small, they're <laughs> yeah. so portable, and people carry them around, or they put them in the bottom of a file cabinet, or whatever. So, you know, Matt, you probably want to listen to Scott back up online for free. A thumb drive is going to be great, but just remember, if you want to have that information around in ten years, a thumb drive is probably not your best answer for you know serious archival purposes. And it's it's problematic. It's like archival grade CDRs and DVDs, but I have some questions about the longevity on those that I'm still trying to work out because I think there's like some Rico and Code vetted archival grades, you know, uh, writable disks that should last much longer than that, but I'm a little kind of... Yeah. I, 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 I really like the online stuff and, and I, you know, the accessibility and the fact that it's being managed remotely is really nice. And before you get all excited about SanDisk's new SD Worm Cards, which stands for Write Once, Read Many. Hey, V. Can I have my phone back? Oh, yeah. <laughs> There you go. Thank you. Enjoy. Thanks, Rhiannon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Worm Cards, which stands for, as I said, write once, read many. That promises a 100-year life of your data, assuming you can find an SD card reader and a compatible program in 2111. You need to find a way to write to that disk. That can be, they can be read by anything, but you can only write to them with certain digital cameras and camcorders. Currently, the biggest use for the one gigabyte SD Worm Cards are used to gather forensic data from crime scenes. Hmm. Very interesting. Apparently because you, you can't change the information when it's, once it's burned on the SD worm card, mm -hmm. so that's considered sort of an acceptable replacement for 35 millimeter film. Ah, or, gotcha. Yeah. Man, I feel bad keeping her phone from her for so long. Teenagers can't be separated from their phones that long. It's, it's unhealthy. But they can text quickly. Yeah. She'll Ooh. catch up. It's time now to thank one of our sponsors, HostGator. Looking for a place to launch a blog or a website? Frustrated with customer support at your current hosting provider? Go with HostGator and get up and running in minutes. With plans starting at just $4.95 a month, you get top-rated 24-7 customer support, access to tools including a website builder with over 4,000 templates, and HostGator will even migrate your current site for free. Servers are 130% powered by wind energy. It's completely green web hosting. You get unlimited disk space, unlimited bandwidth, and a 45-day money-back guarantee. Plus, on top of all that, you get $100 Google AdWords credit to market your website. Right now, for Revision 3 viewers, HostGator is offering 20% off your order or your first month free. Go to www.hostgator.com and enter the code Texilla HD at checkout to get your discount. Pookie writes in, can you recommend a Wi-Fi capable color laser printer that won't be super expensive to own? I'm looking for a desktop unit to print graphics, the occasional two-sided owner's manual, and promotional materials for my record label. I'd also like to be able to print to it from my laptop across my wireless network. 
Shanks, Pookie in Wellington, Florida. So color and laser printers have actually gotten really cheap. Konica Minolta's Magic Color 1600SW sells for $150 to $190 if you shop around, but hey, it's printing, which means consumables, and printing full color pages is a lot more expensive than black and white pages. Think 18.5 cents per color page and 3.5 cents per black and white page. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot less than it would cost to print color down at the local copy store, but it's worth keeping in mind. Yeah, it's actually amazing how much. They're FedEx now, now they used to be the Kinko's office centers. Like, I, last time I went to one of those because I was in the middle of nowhere and needed a printer, I ended They're up so spending like $18 for six pages. It's um, so not worth it. Yeah, it's probably more like $18 for, for 12 or 15 pages, but it just, it was a lot of money. Yeah. So here's the thing, right? Those cost per page numbers uh, came from a review of Dell's 1350 CNW color LED printer by PC Mag's M. David Stone, a man I've spent many hours with locked up in labs testing printers. <laughs> it's a PC Magazine editor's choice. It's got Wi-Fi, Ethernet, you can password lock color printing, and the 1350 CNW sells for a mere $230. This is a color laser printer for like, you know, it's just like, it's amazing how cheap these have gotten. Dell's 1355 multifunction color printer also got the editor's choice done in a recent review, which of course allows you to do scanning, that kind of thing. You can do faster, maybe higher quality, say if you need to do lots of five point text and giant legal documents, um, if you roll with something like a, one of Xerox phaser printers, but you'll spend twice as much up front on the hardware, maybe even more. You might also check out Epson's workforce lineup, quality stuff. It's inkjet, not laser, but it's still in that three hundred dollar range. Yeah, I've yeah. got the um, I've got the HP uh, oh. Gosh, I can't remember the, the unit number of it. But it's an all-in-one printer. It does e-printing, right. which is really nice, too. And I don't think I spent more than 200 bucks on it. It's inkjet, though. It's not laser. Um, but it's been working pretty well for us, although they gave us a <laughs> bum power supply. Ouch. And so the thing just stopped working one day. It wasn't drawing power because, you know, it has a little light light indicator mm -hmm. on, the, on, the, on the brick. I was like, yeah, that thing's dead. So we had to wait for them to send out another one. So that was kind of a pain. But it does scanning and printing and faxing if you have a fax number. Yeah. If you have a, have a small business, multifunctions can be pretty slick, and there's really not much, if any, penalty. Unless you're doing, like, I need super high-end photo printer, you can get some pretty amazing results out of the inexpensive multifunctions. Yeah. So. Printers are cool. I like yeah. printers. I don't know why. I've always really enjoyed printers. Well, because they take stuff and you carry them around and tack it to the refrigerator. And I like the, yeah. the like the Epson's, the four by six uh, photo printers mm -hmm. are amazing. Yeah, those are pretty cool too. So you can have a party with one I, of those. I've never had a photo printer before. Like a well, like a small <sighs> photo printer roundup. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I get excited. I don't print pictures anymore. I keep them all digital. We got to get a picture. <sighs> I don't know it. You should do a picture party with your friends. Oh, you know what I got to get? We got to get those gray label Polaroid stuff in, the new uh, Lady Gaga stuff that we covered at CES. Then we will have a picture party, a Lady Gaga picture party. Thank you. Up next, Shane writes in, Patrick and Veronica, I would like to know if I can take the three terabyte hard drive out of my new WD MyBook Essential that has USB 2.0 and USB 3.0 and put it into another WD one terabyte MyBook hard drive enclosure with FireWire 400. I have an iMac with FireWire and no USB 3.0 options. Thank you, biggest fan, Shane. I personally have had mixed success swap. Biggest fan. Biggest fan. It's fun to say. Almost as much fun as Picture Party. Picture Party. Biggest fan. <laughs> picture Party. I've had big success swapping drives in and out of Western Digital's MyBook drive enclosures. First up, they're not really designed to be cracked open. It's got a whole sort of really crazy puzzle aspect. They're not glued or anything, but putting them back together because it's amazing. Like you know, that you, sounds like a challenge. You crack here and then you pop loose all of the the things. So it's kind of like a you know one thing goes over this C shape, goes around this C shape, and then you find out there's sort of four rubber corners and all of the L. LEDs for all of the lights or maybe attached to a little PCB uh. at the other end of the board through these sort of clear plastic light pipes and you end up with a sort of array of parts and a drive and then when you take your two terabyte drive out of the enclosure and put it in the one terabyte drive enclosure that has eSATA, it won't recognize a two terabyte drive. <laughs> and then you put everything back together eSATA. and you think that was a great use of two hours. I still haven't figured out quite why the, the one terabyte enclosure wouldn't see the two terabyte drive, uh, but the drive worked just fine plugged into a motherboard or its original case. Um, can you take it back to the store for one of Seagate's GoFlex external drives? Yeah. 
the GoFlex drives let you swap between USB 2.0, 3.0, and FireWire 800 adapters. You do have to pay for the extra adapter that yeah. doesn't come with the drive, but, but it's the still options an option. there, and yeah. you're not breaking into your your hard drive enclosure. Right. Um, you'll need a nine to six pin FireWire cable to plug the 800 drive into your IMAX 400 port. But hey, like we said, you won't have to tear apart your MyBook and figure out if you can put it back together again. It's like Humpty Dumpty, except way more expensive. <laughs> um, you can just go for it, and if it doesn't work, you could buy an external FireWire enclosure that's actually designed to be opened. And there's lots and lots and lots of those. Mac well, Alley. Where's the fun in like, that? Well, I'm just saying. That, that, it's a fallback. It's a fallback. It's a fallback. Okay. Just say it. And by the way, if you've got a 32-bit operating system, you probably don't want to bother buying a 3-terabyte drive because <laughs> there's a 2.19-terabyte cap based on the whole 32-bit addressing thing. We're not going to do this. It's basically greed tables versus master partitions. I don't want to talk about it. Master, different, yeah, it's different day. MBA for another time. Greed. Yeah, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, Netflix. Netflix is awesome. You stay in your house, they deliver you movies. Just basically, it's cheap. A monthly fee, so there's no, no travel into the red box and waiting in the angry line of teenagers or going to the blockbuster, assuming you can still find one open in your neighborhood. And as a Netflix Unlimited member, you can instantly watch thousands of television episodes and movies streamed right to your PC, your Mac, or right to your TV via a Netflix-ready device like the Xbox 360, the PS3, the Nintendo Wii, and many, many, many other devices like the Apple TV, the Roku box. I could go on. There's a list of Blu-ray players and televisions. Netflix is all over the place. And you know what? You can still get DVDs or Blu-rays by mail in about a single business day. Watch as many movies as you want, anytime you want. And believe me, I know that Netflix is running at 4 a.m. right after I put my son back to sleep. No late fees, no due dates. And as a new member and a Techzilla viewer, you can score a free Netflix trial membership. But do us a favor. Go to Netflix.com slash Techzilla and sign up when you do. Because if you use that URL, Netflix.com slash Techzilla, They'll know we sent you, and we'll be able to keep bringing this show to your doorstep or your internet connection. They will lavish your... gifts upon us. Mostly they pay the man, so we get paid. There's that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Please support us by supporting our sponsors like Netflix. You have a Netflix account? I do. Do you use it obsessively? Constantly. 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 It makes everything better. It sure does. And it looks like it's time for another website we just can't get enough of. A website that we just can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, or just too darn irresistible. This week's pick, ClientsFromHell.net. This one comes to us from Edward on our Facebook page, who says, for all the freelancers out there, ClientsFromHell.net showcases some of the most inane and ridiculous requests from clients to the people they have working for them. There's a very strong website and graphic design bent to the site, but I think anyone can relate to getting comments like these before. Some of my recent favorites include, write copy for this great new promotion we'll be running. Whenever someone buys a house from us, they'll receive free McDonald's vouchers. Make the ad sound classy and exclusive. Or, I'm sure we can find a student to do it if you're not willing to. And finally, we have no budget for creativity or innovation. So if you're looking for a laugh, or if you just want to know that you're not the only one in the world dealing with insane or demanding clients, then head over to clientsfromhell.net today. Just last week, we talked camera and shooting 3D with Alec Lindsay. The Pixel Core founder is back this week to talk about what it actually takes to take raw video and turn it into 3D. And it changes a lot. I gotta take these off now, my head's gonna explode. <laughs> <laughs> this is the red and, red and green lenses are no way to look at the world. Trans metropolitan to the side. I am not Spider Jerusalem. That's an obscure Warren Ellis reference. You can Warren Ellis reference. In any case, you, we were talking before, and you said at the low end, you've got a $400 camera, there's software in the box, it makes 3D video easy. At the high end, you probably take your $15,000, the footage from your fifty or $20,000 camera, you put it in a box, the software makes it easy. What's actually going on with the software, and, and what do I have to do as Joe end users to make my 3D video? So the... Uh, um it, it's it's different because this is an area where we're really getting into the it hasn't been figured out yet. Right. You know, so there's a lot of you know we're figuring it out, which I'll show you here in a second. The a lot of the companies are still figuring it out. So for instance, if you open up in Final Cut, mm -hmm. there's some plugins to allow you to view it. Most guys that I know right now, and the way that we're doing it is we just kind of we set up a sequence where we set up the stereo, right. and then we bring that sequence in and we only look at one eye. So we just edit the whole thing with the left eye, and then it goes and at the back end we and go back and, and turn the other one on. So that you know that's kind of the uh, you know because what you're really doing is what's great though is that we don't care what that end product is. Mm -hmm. We don't care whether it's side by side or or top over bottom or interlaced or red blue or whatever it is. Right. 
because it's two whole signals. Like when, when we capture out of this guy here, mm -hmm. we have two whole, we have two SD cards or two SDI outs that right. we're just capturing the whole signals out. And you don't really need to edit both of those. You edit one and then the magic happens with the plugin. As long as you got them all synced up. You know, mm -hmm. that's the main thing. Now this, this captures in a, it captures the stills in an that's MXO. The Fuji. The Fu this is the Fuji W3, mm -hmm. the Fuji Film W3, and it captures the stills in a, what's called an MXO file. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it has, um, and then it captures these AVIs that are that are batched up with the two of them together, the two both left right. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, interestingly enough, the software for the the Fuji is almost you know useless. So so what you do is there's a <laughs> there's actually a free software called Stereo Splicer uh, for the Mac and PC mm -hmm. that some guy wrote that is awesome. So, so you, you know. Uh, you download their software, and then it, it'll split it all up for you. And then you can also get um, viewers. So mm -hmm. this is one of the things. This is uh, Luxology makes this thing called uh, Luxfolio. And what that's going to do is it's going to let you look at the stills, for instance. These are a couple different stills, whether they're 3D. Uh, and what it's doing here is you can decide, oh, I want them. I just want to look at the left. I want to look at the anaglyph here. Um, I want to look at the wobble. So it just bounces mm -hmm. it back and forth. Or I can look at it at two up, and that's the way a lot of um, TVs work. So one of the things, the kind of lowest common denominator, is I want to output it to a TV. I can set it up for side by side, full screen, and if you've got a 3D TV, mm -hmm. it knows what to do with that. Like you say, oh, right. you're, you know, on, I have a Viera 50 inch or whatever at my house, and I just say you're getting side by side, and it, it pops it right in, and my glasses work, and everything's good. The uh, uh, and that's one of the things. That's to also know is right. that YouTube will work that way. You know, if you if you upload something to YouTube side by side mm -hmm. and tell it this is 3D, YouTube will convert it to every format known to man. Ooh. I mean, and, and then and then it's just a drop down. So if you're wondering like where would I put this, mm -hmm. you can put it on YouTube today and make it work. You know, um, and people can watch it either through their home theater device or their boxy box or yeah. If, if they have a 3D TV, they can they can put it in full screen from YouTube and and the, and the TV will know what to do with it. So in, in terms of making a Blu-ray, is it pretty much just outputting side by side and dumping it on a Blu-ray in the right? In yeah, there's no cheap way to do that. Like you're not really like I don't know how to do that at home. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, I know how to. Send that. You send the two plates to the to the right. uh, finishing house, and they and then it they do uh, they, they cast a spell, and it <laughs> and it comes out working. I, 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 we, we've we've been bouncing around. I, for those of you who are not familiar with Alex, I want to put this into context here. Alex is the only guy I know who's kind of like own 4K. It's, technically, it's not yours, but you basically have 24/7 access to your own personal $400,000 4K. Well, movie I, it's camera. a 444 camera. Excuse so 444, and I do own it. So it's so oh, he it, does own it. Yeah. So so the uh, it's it's a it's yeah a little. little I, well, I, I bring that up though. But for you to say magic it's, happens, which is the whole, you know, you know, at this point it is indistinguishable from magic, that means it's seriously complicated to actually make this stuff work. Right. It, right at least now, at the professional level. To finish level. it at the professional right. level, we haven't been, and, and, and I have to admit that we're spending so much energy worried about capturing it and posting it mm -hmm. that we just haven't really looked at it. The other thing that we've been looking at is we just don't know if plastic is really going to last. So right. part of why I don't know how to, how to do it is because I haven't had to. I, I, I've kind of decided that's dead technology, and, and and so and so I'm not. You know, I don't like. I don't want to play. Blu-ray is dead when I can get decent 1080p video over the internet. That's a whole it is, other it is, conversation. Now, now this is this. What's yeah? What's going on in this? So, so you guys are developing an application. Yeah. So one of the things that so we have an application called Conduit, mm -hmm. um, DV Garage, my one of my other companies. Um, DV Garage has a program called Conduit, and what it allows you to do it's a nodal compositor uh, like Shake used to be or like mm -hmm. Nuke is, but it sits on top of the GPU and a lot of uh, companies use it as a preview process. So if I'm on a green screen stage and I want to know that my composite is really working, I want to see it in real time. Okay. We started getting, you know, of course, 3D is starting to pick up, and our clients started, uh, you know, asking for, uh, can you, can we view 3D? Can we preview 3D? And uh, and so we started building it, and this is where 3D. You start going, oh right, you know, like, right. oh now we have to pay attention to this. So you can see that this is. Uh, this is a composite with the lovely I, Justine. Um, she was kind enough. It's a little dark there, but uh, the uh, here's what we're kind of dealing with here. So what this allows us to do is essentially control all aspects of what's coming in. So here you have our two separate images. That's Justine left and right. This is the background left and right. All of this was shot on this 3D A1, mm -hmm. so the Panasonic 3D A1. But now what we have to do is we have to pay attention to, for instance, the the horizontal the horizontal shift. So you know. The convergent wasn't quite right. right, so I can go in here and I can tweak that. Okay. You know, I can pull it back together a little bit. Vertical shift, rotation, scaling, all of these things. You know, whether it's going, whether both cameras are lined up. So, for instance, this one's great because it's generally all lined up, mm -hmm. right? But 
you know, you get a rig, you know, that, that has two different cameras. Right. And now you have Maybe to make, they're a little farther off, or, or they're a little tweaked they're, or, one's tweaked one way, or one's tweaked up. And so we have to have all this post. You know, it's no longer like oh, the camera was just a little rotated. Right. It's now rotated and it doesn't work in 3D anymore. So it sounds like it's not too. It's it, the editing process is very similar to traditional 2D editing. You just yeah. want to hold longer cuts. You want to keep things centered. It's when you're actually rendering to 3D that you're suddenly thinking, what I really need is a 23 core. I-92 well, processor that doesn't the, exist yet. The big thing is is that you start thinking about, oh, right, if I roto, if I do a rotoscoping, which is mm -hmm. drawing, I have to do it to both frames. You know, because they're, they're, right. they're not the same. It's not like I can copy one over to the other. They're, they're just different. a little bit different. They're a little different. <laughs> That's you know, how so, the stereo part works. Yeah, and so, so, the, so, so suddenly all of these things become much more, you know, everything becomes more, more complicated. Mm -hmm. And, for instance, we used to have to worry about focal length. So we, we would shoot, uh, you know, we'd shoot this in one focal length, and if it was off by a little bit, on the other focal length, you know, you, you get close, as close as you could, and you tried to match it as often as you could. Got it. But now you have to worry about the convergence. So wh what is my, you know, so because so, if the convergence on one, on your background plate right. isn't matching the convergence on your foreground plate, now the foreground looks like it's somewhere else in the background. <laughs> you know, so, so there's, and, and so then we have to use these tools to go back and correct that, you know, and, and, and to, to view it live on set to make sure that we're getting it right. DV Garage is the home of the software you're just showing us right now. What was the name of the software you said that made the W3 useful in stereo? Stereo, uh, stereo Splicer. Stereo Splicer. And for more information, DV Garage, Pixel Core. What's the website for Pixel Core? Uh, you can see our podcast at pixelcore.tv or, or our, uh, our services at pixelcore.com. And remember, kids, you can always use more memory and more processor, especially when editing 3D. Alex, thanks so much for the time, man. Thanks for having me. It's time to thank one of our sponsors, Carbonite. Eventually, you're going to have a computer disaster, but if you have Carbonite online backup, your files will be backed up automatically and safely off-site, so it'll be easy to get them back. You can access your backed up files remotely from any computer or from your iPhone or Blackberry with a free Carbonite app. Carbonite costs just $55 a year for unlimited backup for your PC or Mac, but when you use the offer code Texilla to start your free 15-day trial, you'll get two months free if you choose to buy. All the details are at Carbonite.com, and remember to use the offer code Texilla to get two months free with purchase. Ray has a question about camcorders. He writes, My mom and I are searching for a camcorder that can take HD video. We're tight on money, so it has to be under $500. A few dollars over is okay, though. Any suggestions? Ray in Delano, California. You're in luck. Uh, most, if not all, of the HD right. Pocket camcorders on the market these days are well under $500. They're like well under $200 yeah, in a lot of cases. Yeah, most time. Uh, they lack many of the features you'll find in the full-featured camcorders, but they take great video and they're very easy to use. Uh, my personal favorites include the Kodak ZI8 HD. Own one. You own one? Good. Mm -hmm. um, I have a feeling that maybe the Kodak is due for an upgrade, which is one of the reasons it could be on sale right now. And of course, the Flip Minnow HD, which is $229.99. The Creative Vado HD third generation is $169.99, which is a nice middle ground between the two of those. Um, if you need something a little more powerful and with the ability to zoom and adjust things like white balance, ISO, and shutter speeds, our friend Lori Grunin over at CNET has a great list of HD camcorders under $600, several of which fall under your price point of $500. Um, another great place to check out is camcorderinfo.com. They do more granular reviews, posting detailed performance breakdowns for each camcorder covered, and how they rate in areas like low light performance, color accuracy, handling, etc. Some things to keep in mind as you shop. Uh, first, make note of features that you want so you can effectively <laughs> compare different models and makes. Um, you can very easily wind up spending more than you need to when you buy a camera that has features you'll never ever even use. Now it doesn't do, it's kind of funny because I know people People who literally never take their cameras off of automatic, but were really explicit about it being able to use arcade settings, and you know, like, well, I need a lens, so I can, you know, I need a camera I can swap lenses on, and it's like, yeah, well, that's yeah. one of the reasons the the pocket camcorders are so popular because right. they do one thing, they do one thing pretty well, and they don't fuss around with a lot of extra features that people don't need. Um, <laughs> second, cheaper camcorders use smaller imaging sensors. This usually translates into poorer low light performance than more expensive models, but if you're shooting during the day or under well lit areas, it won't matter as much. I saw some pretty expensive Sony cameras actually that were, you know, they had a lot of great features, they worked good normally, but they had really bad low light right. sensors. So if that's something you're looking for, 
look elsewhere. Um, also, do you want solid state, i.e. hard drive or flash memory based or tape based camera, for example? There are still tape based cameras out there, believe it or not. Um, there are advantages to each and you'll need to figure out what works best for you. In our experience, we prefer flash card or tape based cameras. Yet, yes, Flash card, I, I, tape is dead to me. There are good reasons yeah. for using tape for a lot of people, mostly professionals, but I just, I don't want to ever deal with tape. I again. have about 400,000 um, little Right. Mini, mini DV tapes. They're great for if you, at if, home. <laughs> no, I will never use. But you also, it's like it's like video. You're shooting video every day, and mm -hmm. when you shoot a zillion million miles of video, you end up with huge storage problems. If you're going to be like I am, you know, if you're using it every day, like I'm doing a, a video blog every mm -hmm. day, storing that can get really impressive totally. after a while. And yes, there are even Tapes hard drive. That hard drive storage solutions for camcorders as well. They're not quite as popular, but they still exist. Um, it's you get convenient. a huge amount of storage, uh, just yeah. don't drop it. And remember that if you're at Disneyland and you fill up the hard drive, you've got to go back to the hotel room and empty the hard drive. Yeah. So. So, um, personally, I've had good luck using Panasonic's in this category in the past, um, but you might want to head over to your local big box store to get some hands-on time with a few of them yourself. Just see how they feel, see if you like have an easy time using right. the menu system and and just how they look in general. The really small cameras can be enormously difficult to hold steady. Yes. So a monopod can be a great investment. Just, it's basically a stick you screw the camera onto. And if you care about audio quality, um, you're going to want a, a device that allows you to plug an external microphone into yeah. it. And the less expensive the camera is, the less likely it's going to have a decent onboard mic, and the less likely it, it will have the ability to plug an external microphone in. Very true. Yeah. So next, uh, Jason emailed us this question asking, we recently moved to a new house, and thanks to Revision 3 and Netflix, I have cut the satellite cord for life. <laughs> now I would like to sever the landline cord for good as well. I've been doing research on devices like Magic Jack, but I'm leaning more towards the UMA Telco for its simplicity, also known as making a grandma usable. With Google showing great promise, uh, should I hold off until someone links POTS phones, that's plain owned telephone service, uh, to Google Voice, or should I make the change now? What are your thoughts? Jason in Charlotte. Well, if you have the UMA Tello and a Premier account, you can use the Google Voice plugin. You'll be able to access Google Voice's voicemail, call presentation, uh, listen in, and caller ID features. The UMA Tello is $249.99, but that's without the handset, which will cost you another $50. Um, UMA Premier service is $9.99 a month, or $119.99 a year, and that'll let you port your current phone number over, along with other features like the Google Voice add-on and conferencing. But if you just want pods without all the extras, UMA does offer for a cheaper service. By default, the phone service will be free, but you still need to pay something like $375 a month to cover government fees and taxes. But that's it. The Uma Tello can work with any existing landline phone. Just plug the phone into the out jack on the Tello. You still get voicemail, and if you want to move your existing landline number, Uma will charge you a one-time $40 fee. But you'll need to keep your landline until you get Uma running, since the process of moving your landline number involves them contacting your phone company and closing your account to get the number. Roger uses Uma and finds it a, quote, satisfactory solution. That's unquote. high praise coming from Roger. Yeah, actually, it is <laughs> high praise coming from Roger. He actually finds the audio to be much clearer and cleaner than what AT&T was providing to his home at a considerably greater monthly cost. Yeah. Magic Jack is an option, might be a little more complicated. Yeah, Magic Jack is definitely a little more cheap, for sure, inexpensive, <laughs> rather, and it might be a little more complicated to kind of set up in, this in, in your particular grandma's instance. sense. Yeah. yeah, in your grandma's case. Um, but they do, uh, they, they skimp a little bit on the customer support in order to provide that, that cheap <laughs> you cost You get the of thing entry. in the box, you plug, you plug, you're done. And if They're hands off. Yeah. Yeah. Finally, we get this incredulous reply to an earlier segment from Seth. Seth writes in, as you were stating the attributes of the new Dell handheld and mentioned the wireless BG only, lamenting the lack of wireless N, the camera was scanning the specs. Screenshot below. It states wireless BGN under connectivity. What give, Seth? Well, you are right. Um, while I can't recreate how I came to that conclusion, and trust me, I have tried. Uh, maybe I was looking at the old spec sheet from the Dell 5. Hey, I, I don't know why. None of my other specs were wrong, so I don't know how I just got that spec off. I've actually come to the conclusion that my iPhone 4 doesn't support N, even though it supports 2.4 gigahertz N. Apparently, we just 
suck. Suck or hate N, wireless N for some reason. But we love wireless N. There is wireless <laughs> N in the Dell Streak 7. Yes. Uh, so thanks for pointing that out. Um, yet another reason to enjoy the 7 inch tablet. Which you are actually taking on an extended sojourn and will be giving yes. us the full battery life it report. It is coming to glorious New York City with me tomorrow. And actually, I guess I will be returning from glorious New York City when you see this episode. I'm going to test the battery life, see how it feels. Tegra 2 versus the cross country flight. Yeah, we'll see. That's going to be interesting. We shall see. That's actually one of the big questions I've had, actually. Tegra Number two, powerful processor. What's the battery life like? Mm -hmm. Everybody watching, we love on your questions. Please email us, techzilla at revision3.com. Tech help, product reviews, how tos. You ask us, we'll do it. But we need those emails. Don't be shy. Send them into techzilla at revision3.com or. Even better, send us in a video question. Think of all the fun you can have in the admiration of all your friends and family when they see your mug on our show. Just keep it to 15 seconds, upload to YouTube, and send us a link in an email with video question in the subject line. And as always, you can find us on Facebook at Facebook. Facebook.com slash Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Until next time, you've been watching Taxilla. Bye.